and then this week we finally get in the lab and start making things. Uh, so let me pick up from last week. Uh, we had missed, well, first from the open time, I had a note that Leon and Yusif had their hands raised. Do either of you want to share anything before we start? Hello, Neil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Adrian Torres from Fallab Leon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last week I hands up the 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 hand because I want to talk about the the week assignment. If I can. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Tell me the name. Uh, Adrian Torres. Um, Adrian. Torres. Yeah. What did you want to talk about? Uh, from oh, this week or, or the week after? No, it, it's just. Did you have something you wanted to share from last week? Oh no, I I want to talk about my final project. If, if no, you like. sorry. Yes, sorry. That. Ah. Um, let me just explain the algorithm. There's a few hundred of you, and so we can't take you each in turn and have you all ask final project questions. Um, just to recap the algorithm. I'll do the random review, and through the random review, we hope to get through everybody. The random review should eventually get to everybody one time. And then the, the final part of the class isn't primarily for final project questions. It's for topics from the preceding week. And so as we get, you know, this week is going to be about cutting. And during the review, we'll do the random review, but the last part of the review is people will show progress they made on cutting or issues they had, but but it, it's it's tied to what we covered in that week. But um, we just don't have time for to take one on one final project questions. Uh, in, um, okay. So, okay. So we'll Thank you. you random, yeah, we'll get to you in the random review. Um, so let's see. We did miss. Uh, Vigyan Ashram, uh, is uh, Manoj here? Yes, uh, hello, Neil. Manoj here. Good. Okay. I, okay, good. Can you explain Fab Lab Zero? Uh, okay, so Fab Lab Zero is the uh, first community Fab Lab that has been set up outside MIT, uh, after MIT Fab Lab. And primarily, Vigyan Ashram Fab Lab is uh, working on kind of a project that is related to Fab Village to make uh, rural India self-sustain itself. By, right. uh, so, sorry, ju just to explain, because I, I love this picture in particular. Um, uh, this was the original Fab Lab, <laughs> but before there were Fab Labs, that little hut. Um, and then this is in a remote part of rural India, and but th it's grown all the way into this lab. Um, so that's Fab Lab Zero, and that's the current lab. Okay. Um, tell us about yourself. Uh, so um, I am currently uh, working as a, a startup CTO. Uh, so I was uh, doing Fab Academy in 2019. Uh, I had um, yet to uh, finish my final project, uh, but uh, I couldn't uh, because I got a chance to be with a startup and a team. Uh, I joined and. Uh, I'm working with Aerogram Private Limited in uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, so okay. we, we are primarily into making uh, city scale networks for pollution monitoring. And okay, good. So, uh, so this is uh, one of the first prototype that was built. Sorry, hold, uh, it, hold it a little higher. So it's uh, made with okay. NDF and uh, this uh, plant tower Chinese sensors. Um, okay. uh, this has been doing good in market. We are trying to raise awareness about pollution. Good. And uh, because Delhi being the most polluted city mm. in the world, uh, so, and uh, we are trying to uh, convince public and the private organizations here to uh, make, uh, uh, you know, make sure that they monitor their uh, pollution level around them. And particularly, we are monitoring particulate matter, uh, PM 2.5. And uh, we say we have to do micro mapping uh, because these pollution levels vary every 100, 200 meters. And uh, we have uh, very limited uh, pollution monitoring devices around the city to actually plan policies for the uh, you know, city itself. Yeah. 
Got it. Um, and Thank so, uh, what you. have you finished and what do you have left to finish for Fab Academy? Right. Uh, so, I actually changed uh, my project. Last time I was trying to work uh, work on a uh, electronic nose, um, okay. but uh, it seemed uh, that particular project is uh, not much useful right now. Uh, so to optimize my current work and uh, necessities as per vegan ashram. So we are trying, uh, like I decided to uh, make this project, so LoRa one uh, system for smart farming. So right now I see in IoT, uh, we are uh, getting into long range uh, you know, in the free band, ISM band uh, communication. So, uh, LoRaWAN is something right now still uh, very unexplored in India, and it I really believe it will help uh, rural India a lot uh, by making sure all the uh, uh, you know sensors available to uh, farmers. Yeah. To make, what, uh, what kind different. of range do you, uh, are you looking for? Uh, so. The Lora one theoretically can go up to five, six kilometers also, but uh, it's in the spare spectrum. Uh, it is something called spare spectrum frequency modulation. So, uh, depending on the packet size, uh, I, um, if I'm sending less packets, I can get more range. Right. Um, people have tried up to 20 kilometers also, as, as far as I see in YouTube. Right. The, the uh, reason I'm asking that is um, quite a few of these can do that range. And so I, I think a, a nice thing to do on this project is um, test with. So for everybody else, we'll be covering this in networking week. Um, but I would test with Laura. Um, yes. But in so addition. I, yeah, go ahead. I do have RFM 95 that you have put in the uh, syllabus. Right. Uh, and so trying again, these. Right, those all depend on the antenna. Um, yes. And uh, so, and one of the tricks that we found is um, it, it's very non trivial to design long range antennas. Um, but the very simplest thing to do is just add a parabolic reflector. And so, if you put <laughs> whatever radio you have that has a shorter range antenna at the focus of a parabola, um, then the issue, and you noted, has to do with the encoding. Because for things like Wi-Fi, you have to tweak the, you know, the timeouts. Um, yeah. But th th there's Wi-Fi tweaks for long range. And so with, with just a Wi-Fi radio and a parabola, we were getting, again, like 10 kilometer ranges. Um, and so, yeah, the, and then, um, you know, yet another example is the, um, uh, let's see, let me remember the Bluetooth modules, the, yeah, Fanstel also has Bluetooth modules and their longest range ones, uh, again, these go up to kilometers with that antenna. Um, so I think what would be interesting is all of these radios can do kilometers with some okay. coding tweaks and some antennas. And it'd be interesting to do an exploration, you know, of the trade-offs among them. Yeah, right. Laura may so, win, but, but, you know, make part of the project to, to, to really characterize that. Right. So Neil, I, I also... Sorry, we lost you. Um, so hard one part of uh, notes if you need. So uh, with uh, things that you suggested, can we yeah. get uh, uh, maybe make a gateway that can support many number of nodes? Right. All, the usual all, all, yep, I understand. All, all of them have versions of uh, mesh routing. Right. Um, so every one of these, you'll find mesh routing projects for them. Okay. okay. And, and so I'd explore that. Um, let's see, DMarque is asking about health risks. Um, <clears throat> This is a sensitive and confused issues. Um, uh, high power microwaves, like at a, a radar um, for an airport, if you stand right in front of it, um, there's so much RF power that it cooks you and it heats you. And that's clearly a health issue. But the fields from the, the kind of radios we're talking about nobody has ever been able to conclusively pr prove any sort of health effects. And 
So there's no data to suggest any health effects from any of these radios. And the other thing is to understand the testing of that is way down in the margins of you know, anytime you get in a car, the risk to you is huge and it's easy to measure. So risk perception is very nonlinear, um, but, but you should be aware, just telling, answering this question for everyone, there's absolutely no data of any kind that suggests these sort of uh, radios have any reason to be concerned about the health. Right. Um, yeah, and so LoRa has been coming for a while. It's interesting. By all means, experiment with it. But just do explore the space of long-range uh, mesh networks. There's a lot of interesting options. Yes, thank you. OK, good. And so with that, we'll go to the now the random generator. And once again, the random generator, um, we should be able to cycle through everybody um, uh, picking this way. So. Here we go. Um, not found. Singapore, Juliana, not found. Be ready to unmute as you come up. Neil, Neil, Juliana is uh, Juliana is withdrawn from the course because she's okay. just started a new job. Okay. Fine. Um, Comp Linfort, Kai, not found. Uh, I'm sorry, um, I, I think um, uh, Kai is having some kind of delay. He will come later. He's a continuing student. When he comes I back, I, I will. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, was Kai there? Yeah, no, I, I'm, um, he's not here because he's sick. Okay. So, um, sorry, let me get into the right place. Okay. Um, I'll leave. Um, uh, Kai and um, yeah, uh, continuing students don't need to make a new site in the new repo. We can just link back to their old site. Okay, so um, I'll leave Kai. Just uh, speak up when Kai appears. I'll leave Kai in the missed rotation. Sure. Boy, uh, O for three. Uh, ULB Charlotte. She's unable to join because uh, she hasn't get uh, her funding, so she's a dropped out student. Okay. Okay, uh, the VOG, harm. Okay. Hi there. Okay, hi. Um, let's see, VOG, um, uh, I'm not getting the camera yet. Um, we, we hear your audio, but everything is black. There's audio, that should do most of it. Okay. Do you have a camera? We Bob? do have a camera. Yeah. Okay, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Video is even better. Um, so tell us about yourself. Um, I'm Harm van Vught, and um, yeah, I joined. Uh, I'm a lecturer actually on ubiquitous computing sometimes, and I'm really stoked on wind and kite surfing. So that's my final project is about. Sorry, uh, let, let, let me catch up. You're a lecturer for, say more about what you're a lecturer for. At the University of Applied Science in Amsterdam. And okay. I do mostly interaction design courses and uh, a course ubiquitous computing. And that's a, that's a line with my final project. Great. And then what led you to do Fab Academy? Um, Good question. I just I I like to I like to modify things uh -huh. and um, create things, and I like IoT, and I like to bring things in the in the surroundings, like ubiquitous computing, to display or gather information more. Great. Okay, and then um, let's go through what you did for week two. Yeah. Should I take the mouse? There I am. Yeah. Oh. Um, no, I, I'll drive, but just just narrate what you experimented with. Okay, we had like a, a, a really beautiful workshop from uh, Fusion 360. So that's like half of the page. Okay. Uh, very good explanation of it. I tried several 2D. Um, Software too, but this is the 360 Fusion 360 software, 
um, just the steps I did as a personal note to add midpoints, alignments, uh, patterns from uh, from lines, from factors. But, and, and again, for everybody, this is great detail. These sort of notes help you, it helps us follow you, but you'll find a lot of other people use your pages. This is just the right kind of detail. Yeah, thank you. It helped me a lot to look at, uh, of course, the, the course we had. So we yeah. had someone coming in and give us all day course, and it okay. was really convenient, very luxurious. Um, so that at the end, made a little video of what we in class did, and it's a structure with uh, some animation in it. So it's basically what you can do in Infusion 360 is that you add like a rotating point in an animation and then it already works. So it's Good. the final thing was pretty easy. I tried some By the way, sorry, just a little detail. These little video clips, when you compress them, are only a few megabytes. So those don't have to go to YouTube. Those are fine in the repo. Okay. Yeah, it's only you know it's only when you get up to you know tens to hundreds of megabytes in the videos, but a little demo like that will compress down to you know, a few megabytes. Okay, good okay. tip, thank you. Um, and then it's the Photoshop, and I, I started with what could be my final project. I want to display the weather forecast in those peppers. Give you a head start. Um, but I um, had to alter the original painting I have in my house and using uh, using gradients so that's what i'm fiddling around there with okay and um i tried preview on mac of course to take notes using factor software um okay and 3d i did the adobe what was the name again dimensions Dimension. see the process of power it was needed to only run the program it's on the mac and so it was not Doable and the result of uh, Adobe Dimension. There's a cup. There's a white cup on the table. That's uh -huh. the you know what? Okay. Um, the other one. Just by the way, Blender it lives for that kind of compositing. Um, yeah, I I, from college. Yeah. Yeah. It was just the thing that came in mind, and then okay. I try to make the frame I have in my kitchen. Uh, that will be a part of my final project. So I built this frame and it consists of everything the original frame holds. It will take you one minute, so it could be smart to fast forward it. So it's the entire frame with the passport too, with the, with the picture, the painting, the edge, um, just to get a hang of the 3D software. Okay, good. And then I did the same, or actually I tried to add the paramedics to it, but Good. I had to completely rebuild it for three times or something. So um, this is then the paramedic part where I just enter the, um, yeah, enter the values and it changes only the size of the, the glass. The right, that's two. exactly right. And once you get used to that, you'll be spoiled and can never go back to non-parametric design. Okay. I can only agree because it was really nice to do at the end. Um, and then I wanted to make a little video of the of the of my artist impression and use okay. Photoshop, made layers, imported those into Premiere. Okay. And so I had to animate this, and then I had like a really nice. Uh, this is a <laughs> Mac kernel pack. And the reason for this was that the, the original Photoshop files were like 4,000 pixels by two something, okay. 2,000 okay. something. So that was, uh, so this file is actually unusable. So I have to start over again. But at the end, I, I, find, I finally finished my okay. little animation. This, this is what my end was. And then were you using really MPG or was it MP4? Uh, you're right. To that, yeah. It's okay. MP4. It's um, okay. And this should be the final thing at the. Uh, you can see. I will give you a spoiler. You can see the changing peppers. Uh, and there's three days of wind forecast, and I will use thermochromic ink 
to uh, to show in today's really weather windy and so it's three days of forecast in um, yeah in this that's picture. great so let's see you you basically explained but um, say a little more now about the final let's see do you have anything at this link yeah good so talk about the final project uh, or, uh, I want to I like this this uh, what was it again Mark Weiser this calm technology the 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 guy who thought about the right uh, ubiquitous computing term right, uh, right. and I, I like to not have a display on my kitchen table with my son and my <laughs> girlfriend present we actually are not allowed to use any screens on this table but I want to <laughs> keep in contact with the uh, with the forecast because I want to go on the left you see my picture I want to go kind <laughs> of <laughs> so that's that's my passion and the wind is very yeah there's sometimes wind and not every day. Uh -huh. So I need to display the wind prediction without screens and uh, in a ubiquitous phone technology way. So that's what I'm looking into. So maybe it's the it's the paint you see there. The, the yeah. Yeah. And, but I, I'm still looking into into the uh, SNA stocking, but it would be really best to do it. Okay. Uh, that, that's a good scope. Thermochromic inks are a good choice for that. Um, uh, uh, remember, they depend on heat transfer, so you, you, you probably can't have the glass. You need airflow um, to cool them off. To cool them off? Right, meaning that the thermochromic changes color when you heat it. But for the color to change back, it needs heat transfer, so you have to get the heat back out. Uh, but I, I'm not in a hurry. There's a forecast every six hours. Okay, but just you'll need to make sure there's enough heat transfer to the thermochromic. Um, that's a nice scope for the project. And um, what Harm is doing is important, which is you'll see he already has a project on the final project. Right? He's not building it at the end, but he's lagging it as he's working, which is right. Um, there's been a few good weather projects. Um, it, one of the neat ones in Barcelona was the floating cloud. It, um, Santi, do you remember who that was? Um, let's see, Santi, are you in Barcelona? Um, is anybody in Barcelona? Um, Okay, sorry, Neil. Santi, Santi is not here for the moment. He's coming. Oh, right okay. But I, I, sorry, I just found it. Good. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so there have been a bunch of ver variants, but this was one I really liked. Um, uh, this was, and this is a good example of one of these demo videos. So he, he magnetically levitated a weather cloud. And then, um, you know, the cloud would change to show you the forecast. Um, so that, that's just a, a fun example of another kind of weather forecasting site. Uh, okay, good. Thank you, Harm. Uh, we'll go on. Uh, FCT Marco, not found. Um, the, the random generator likes Vigyo Nashram, uh, Nikhil. Be ready to unmute, Nikhil. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, turn on your camera. Yes. Boom. Okay, there you are. So tell us about yourself. Hello, sir. Yeah, tell us about yourself. Uh, I'm Nikhil. 
from Vigyan Ashrams, from Fab Lab Zero Vigyan Ashrams. Okay. So, uh, sir, I have did my B in Mechanical Engineering and I have uh, did the Master of Engineering Thermal uh, Engineering. Okay. So, and then I'm, I'm, I'm working as a... with Shiguan. You're I'm looking to see where that is. This is this is my native place. Okay. Uh, I'm working. I'm working here uh, in Gajanan Maharaj Engineering College as an assistant professor. And I have the, uh, my area of specialization interest is solar engineering, especially but, solar and thermal engineering. And t tell me about how you came to be at Vigyan Ashram. How did that come about? Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we, we are planning to install, uh, we are planning to develop the fab lab in our uh, institute in our college. So with the with this keeping the this vision in mind, we have joined the fab lab uh, uh, here at Vigyan Ashrams. That, that's great. Um, uh, so let's look at your CAD project. Yes, yes sir. My uh, I have currently I have the two ideas that I have represented in assignment once, and uh, go ahead. So I have the two ideas, but uh, uh, in the last week I had the two ideas, but now I am uh, I am focusing on the second ideas because uh, we discussing with my instructor okay. uh, the. They said me to go for the second ideas. So, so now I am. Yes. Is that where should I go to? Do you have that documented? Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. Here in my project, uh, I have I have presented in assignments. Okay. Should Assign I go to week one or week two? Huh. Uh, week one. Okay. Is this uh, the project you want to talk about? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is the first idea. And okay. uh, with the scroll down uh, at the below, the, I, I will present the second ideas. Uh, this one. So, uh, so now, now I am working on this solar powered smart kitchen chimney. So okay. I put one sketch also. Uh, please, please scroll down. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I am planning to uh, do the project on this smart, uh, solar powered smart kidney, uh, chimney, ah, which okay. have the which have the smoke sensor. The smoke sensor can detect the smoke uh, which is coming from the combustions, and uh, when the smoke sensor detect the smokes, the, it can give the signals to the microcontrollers, and microcontrollers can uh, send the signals to the charge controller, which can operate the fan in the chimney. And so with that, the fan will get start and the fan can start to search the air from the that particular area. And he can send that uh, air to the uh, uh, to the filters, where the, the smoke will get filter the particulate matters from the smokes and some hazardous gases will, uh, will get absorbed and then the gas will get exhausted into the atmospheres. So okay. the... Huh. So, yeah, and so um, this, this is a good example for spiral development. The, so the example here would be, the first version would be the exhaust fan, just getting that working. The second version would be to add a sensor to it, Ah, yes, and then sir. the third version would be to make it solar powered. Solar power. Yes. But, but just the, the note is don't try to do all of those in one step. So for, first make an exhaust fan and that's a useful project. Then make an exhaust fan with a sensor, you know, then make an exhaust fan with a sensor and solar power, but do those in three spirals. Don't try to do the whole project in, in one step. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. So, Okay, and so let's talk about then what you did in the CAD week. Uh, yes, sir. This is the second uh, second week assignments. Yep. Here uh, for the 2D, uh, to, uh, raster 2D, I have tried uh, this 
is Krita uh, and James. Yes. Yeah. So uh, just I have put on just some screenshot before and after. For vector 2D, I have tried the coral draw softwares. Uh -huh. uh, I have present one uh, front view, top view, and side view. And uh, then for vector 2D, I have uh, work also on Inkscape. Okay. Uh, then for 3D designs, uh, especially uh, I'm working in uh, free cats. I like it and um, uh, means I have done the numbers of uh, assemb uh, numbers of uh, work on these uh, free cats okay. and also also I have work on the solid work softwares. <clears throat> so I I to develop these objects these uh, in these solid works. Okay. Yeah, and as a beginner, you won't see much difference between FreeCAD and SolidWorks. The difference comes with complexity, that a, just a tool like SolidWorks, the back end can scale to much more complexity as your projects get bigger. Um, yes, yes. So here, I tried to assemble uh, the two, comp two parts in FreeCADs. Right. So, this is the two parts, first and second, and the, the final assembly of the FreeCAD. Okay, and remember, FreeCAD um, extends with workbenches, and so it doesn't have a built-in workbench, but it has a number of plug-in workbenches for assemblies. Yes, it is. So, yeah, again, uh, FreeCAD assembly workbench. Um, so many of the things you, you want in FreeCAD, um, aren't built in, but because it's an open project, people add them. And so there's a number of different workbenches that add uh, assemblies to FreeCAD. Sir, I have added extension file for assembly, okay. assembly to and reports. Uh, so with that extension file, I can download. Okay. Yes. So. Okay. Good, okay, that all looks fine. Yes, sir, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. And let's see, we'll go on and meet more people. Um, Rwanda, Dominique. I'll leave that up, Rwanda. Uh, ZOI, Roberto. Yeah, hello, I'm here. Is it, who is this? Uh, Roberto. Okay, so uh, let me add Dominique to the people we've missed to try to get in the future. And hello. Roberto, um, remind us where ZOI is. Oh, um, I see Rwanda connecting. So um, Rwanda, we're going to go with Roberto, then we'll come back to Dominique. Um, okay, so Roberto, remind us where ZOI is. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I'm from Ecuador. Uh, this is in South America. Uh, uh, the Fab Lab is in the soy, soy Fab Lab, exactly, that one. Yeah. And so is that where it is? Yeah, uh, well, uh, he has two places right now, one in the center of the city, and this is another one. So, okay. yeah. Just reminding everybody where, where Ecuador is. Yeah, this is right in the middle of the, of the world. Okay. It's a really small country. Okay. And so um, tell us about yourself. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. I'm a professor in the university right now. I'm teaching in a public and a private university about industrial design. I'm an industrial designer. Actually, I'm studying my PhD. I'm a PhD candidate. And I'm working in rehabilitation devices for hands. So uh, this is my plan for the final project. Of course, <coughs> I want to improve uh, this design because this is my so last sorry, year. Part, of let, let me just catch up to your background. Um, you know, yeah. For me, part of the goal of the Fab Academy is to kill off industrial design. And what, what I mean by that is historically, it's been segregated. It mean, it okay. separates form and function. And you know, the, the whole goal of what we're here to do is to train design 
of hardware, software, form, function, materials, and, and break the segregation of design. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good suggestion then. Yeah. And so, um, so now talk about what you want to do. Should I go to assignment one for a final project? Oh, oh yeah, of course. Um, like I said before, uh, I'm working with this kind of devices. Well, I was just making a research about hand uh, rehabilitation devices, especially I want to work with a hand arteroides. So the plan is to use all the, these uh, rapid prototyping technologies to get first some hands uh, through the scanning 3D and then try to feel uh, try to fix uh, this modeling in any kind of software software after the, after that after to get this hand in, in the software i would like to work with the hand exoskeleton to to start like um, testing in different kinds of software uh, freecad i was trying to use freecad is a really good one i was i was yeah but yeah this is the second part about the web page Okay. Yeah, and okay. I add some information today, but it was a nine oh five, so it's still pending to deploy. And okay. I. So yeah, just a note on that, Vic, Victor. Once again, Victor stepped in to take over from Fiori on pretty short notice, and so um, he's debugging. We don't understand why these pipelines are running so slowly. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be trying a few things to speed up the pipeline production. Um, uh, so uh, on our side, we're going to debug why the pipelines are running so slowly, but it's a good idea to push your work, not at the beginning of class. There's a big spike right before class. So yeah, I yeah, know, but I was working, I was working very hard in these days because I want to, I am, I'm, I'm, I usually use 3ds Max from Autodesk, uh -huh. uh, but this time I was also trying to use FreeCAD because I really like this kind of 3D modeling software. Right. And so first, just remember my was, advice. Um, Remember my advice to document as you work. So don't push your work at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Um, yeah, I lost my class. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. But okay, but talk through your experience. Just then use words to talk through your CAD experience. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say something. I was in charge of a fab lab in Yachai, in, in another city from Ecuador. And that's why when I started learning about uh, how to make almost anything uh, between the Fab Lab concept. Uh, Roberto Gallo is in charge of Fab Lab Soy, and he was the he was finishing the Fab Academy in those days. So that's why I started learning about this. And my CAD experience with free CAD, um, well, actually I'm teaching 3ds Max in the university, and I, after I started using this uh, free CAD, you uh, start suggesting this software for the students because it's well for me it was pretty new. And it's very useful right now. I couldn't go so well. Uh, I just use well. I use just uh, basic tools, but it was pretty similar. The um, uh, pretty, similar, pretty similar to uh, SolidWorks because we use SolidWorks for mechanical pieces, uh, for mechanical work, and 3ds Max for organic or that kind of modeling with with yeah. um, that kind of grid of maps. Well, uh, I like I said. Sorry again. Before and um, I just put all the information today at 9 on 5. That's why you can't see anything about that. But okay. I will just upload it. OK. Um, let's see. There's a few related projects to that. Um, let's see. Uh, um, comp lint for, um, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can find. Um, Danielle, remind me what should I look for? The Compline for project to make a hand exoskeleton. Hi, Neil. You can look Adriana Cabrera. Oh, sorry, Adriana. Right, Cabrera. Sorry, that was. Um, so. Ad Adriana, um, for many years, has been working on um, making exoskeletons. Um, and so she, uh, um, uh, um, and this is ongoing work. And so she, she, she's a good resource um, <clears throat> for trying to make, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hand exoskeletons. Well, thank you. Yeah, I will. I will contact here. 
to start working because my project is pretty similar, just the focus in hand arteritis. Yeah, yeah. Um, Danielle, is she still around the lab? Uh, she works for another company now, but she's pretty much still involved in this kind of topics. I think uh, she wants to make the old projects with soft robotics and in, in okay. public academy. Okay. Yes, um, so she's she's very engaged and <clears throat> excuse me, as a reminder, don't forget the um, uh, issue trackers. So um, in the, oh, this will be a little, it's not too bad. The if we go to 2020, um, the class project has an issue tracker. And for things uh, that need global communication, use these. <clears throat> you can post an issue here about prosthetics and um, you know, post the work you're doing. You can share it with that people. Use that to communicate across the class. OK, perfect. OK, thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Neil. And then we were going to meet uh, Dominique now in R Rwanda. I saw you trying to unmute. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Dominique Savio. Uh, so I try, I try to go to my- Sorry, Dominique, um, where's your microphone? Can you, can you talk to the microphone? Your level's just a little bit low. I did a post it. I'm trying to, to draw it and I can push in this night because uh, I have sick this week. Okay, but here, Dominique, first tell us about yourself. Uh, myself? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm trainer in the Agahozo Shalom uh, in mechanics lab. Okay. I tried to know the machine, length machine. I used it, used it uh, in industry. Uh, I try to do in the master steel, it is a fabrication of uh, steel, uh, tools, and tube. So I used it in CNC length machine, uh, in CNC uh, router. Okay. By now, I'm coming to, to learn this course, Baba Academy and to, to to grow my my skills uh, to grow my knowledge in technology good okay and um let's see uh so talk about what you did for the for the modeling week uh, the second week yeah just t t tell us what you did this week. This week I tried to, to draw the, for, for using the sword wax. Okay. See, in the, in, the, in the two dimension and three dimension and to, to, to draw with the Inkscape. I import the image uh, for trying to, to, to make a vector. And yep. here in the, I, I use the illustrator for import the image and again for trying to, to do the vector. Okay. Uh, I still continue. Just uh, still on continue. your pages, um, you need a few more words. Your, your pages should have a few more words to explain what the images mean. Okay. I try to, to, to do the drawing because I'm learning to draw. Okay. To, to how, how can I draw and import and draw without import? I can draw. So and then after I try to to demonstrate everything when I I, I did I did it, and then I will post. I think in this evening I try to post it. Okay. Um, and then, uh, what is your plan for a final project? Uh, so, final project uh, as we're planning, I can uh, I use the, the the sketch with the hands, and then I want to take the picture and I I will post it. Yeah. 
I think next week. Okay, but can can mm -hmm. you describe to me what the project is? Yes, sir. Um, can you describe your final project plan? What is the project that you would like to do? Uh, my uh, my idea. So I want to, to I want to do the sliding door, or or window sliding. Okay, you, meaning you want to make an automatic window or door. So you want to know how how can I do or uh, so? Yes, it, it will be automatic when the crowd uh, the weather change the 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 the, the crowd. It can uh, close. And then when the cloud is clear, it can be open. Yeah. If, so if you it, go out when you when you go without closing the door, it can be closed when the cloud change. Right. Um, if you go through the history, you'll see there have been many versions of automatic uh, windows that you can learn from. Uh, there have been a number of projects uh, making um, uh, uh, automatic uh, windows that you can start from um, uh, for your project. Um, okay, um, so that that just add a few more words as you week on your pages, but that looks good. Um, thank you. Um, Dominic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that was Dominic in Rwanda. Then Bubaneswar, Tapas. I'll leave that up. Are you there, Bubaneswar? It's funny how the randomness, it's all random, but how it clusters. We have two pages from Bhubaneswar. We have Tapas and we have uh, Sandeep. It, it, it's of course a, a joke and not true, but it's like a sense of humor in the random generator. Okay, I'll leave those two pages up for Bhubaneswar. Uh, Oh, are you there? Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Here. I'm tapas. Yeah. Okay, good. Be, yeah, be ready to unmute. So, um, yeah, first, I have already unmuted. Okay. Um, they, tell us about the lab in Bhubaneswar. Oh, it's, it's the east, first of, um, east part of India. Uh, it's located in Odisha. Uh, and then. It's so called Temple City about, also. Yeah. Um, this is a place. Let's see. Uh, tell us more about the type of lab, uh, about um, what kind of lab is it? It's a fab lab, um, mini fab lab. But, but like, what is it? Sort of how is it run? Who is it aimed for? What kind oh, of. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, this fab lab is uh, uh, so with the uh, uh, software technology Pax of India. It is a uh, autonomous society under Ministry of IT Government of India for skill development and uh, making prototype for local community uh, the, to develop their skill that uh, established by software technology Pax of India. Good. And now tell us about yourself. Uh, basically, I am working in software technology parts of India as a technical officer. Uh, previously, my job profile was, uh, and uh, uh, before joining in FabLab, I was uh, working as a network engineer. My job was uh, routing, switching, and security. Good. Uh, now it is very new for me. Uh, long back, I was electronics telecommunication engineer. Now, a recent after uh, working more than 10 years, uh, 15 years in uh, routing, switching, and security, now I am joining this uh, lab uh, 
as a uh, uh, and uh, uh, get opportunity to learn um, this kind of uh, making prototypes and uh, new technology and innovation. That's great. Uh, but are you still working for STPI? Yeah, I am an employee of STPI. Okay. I, I'm very happy to hear what you're doing um, yeah. because there have been a number of initiatives in India where the mm -hmm. government will say, like, we'll create thousands of labs. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, that's but right. the skills that's don't right. follow. And so you know, this class isn't easy. It's a lot of work. And I'm happy that you're really doing this to really, you know, develop yeah, the skills yeah. to make good use of the lab. Uh, you, you can uh, also go through our website, fablab.stpi.in. Let's see. Uh, Fab lab. Yeah, stpi.in. Oh, you should put HTTPS. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's coming. Is this it? Yeah, yes. yeah. This is our director general. Okay. Great. Okay. Oh, and there's Sherry at the opening. Uh, our uh, he's a uh, our director general. Side to Sherry. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, great. Okay. Glad to see you joining. So now let's look at um, your CAD week. Uh, CAD work is uh, not submitted. I was a little bit sick, uh, so oh, I have already designed for uh, final project uh, that IoT based smart bottle for healthcare. So, okay. yeah. Uh, so I have already made uh, the documentation, but it is not uploaded. So my okay. idea is uh, basically in healthcare system. I have uh, visited. Uh, I have already seen in so many hospitals. They are uh, using the um, bottles, uh, saline bottles, that electrolyte bottles, which uh, having uh, problems when it is going to end. The, uh, due to the busy schedules of the employees, they cannot change. So the blood is reverse, uh, getting reverse flow from sorry. body to the water. I'm sorry, say, say that again. I didn't follow that. Explain that again. Uh, in in hospitals, uh, basically when the patient is admitted, we are providing uh, the doctors is giving uh, electrolyte bottles. Okay. Electrolyte. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. So uh, basically, uh, the label is when it is going to finish. If it is not changes, the blood will be flow uh, reverse, reverse uh, flow blood towards the bottles. Okay. Okay. And the adjustment of dip, uh, that uh, the drop which is coming from the electrolyte bottle, it okay. is not properly adjusted. It basically, I have seen the uh, nurse and the employees are just watching the clock, uh, okay. watch and uh, adjust this one. So I want to do, uh, develop a device or prototype which can come uh, adjust uh, that kind of thing and uh, uh, alarming to the uh, um, nurse uh, or medical healthcare employee okay. Good. To when it is going to end. Now, you can do it by weight, but, but probably the nicest way to do that is by capacitance. Uh, in the week on input devices, okay. uh, I'm gonna cover how to make a sensor with electrodes and so if the bottle is in here and you have the liquid, um, yes. it'll change the capacitance of, of yeah, an yeah. electrode. And um, it means you, you, you don't have to weigh the bottle. You can just actually sense, sense the liquid in the bottle. And that's a good, good way to do the detection for that. Oh, yes. It, this is a light. Uh, it will count the, from that light. When the drop is crossing through that light, it will capture the count. Well, right, but but I'm suggesting another, yeah, uh, but that's one way to do it, but but both for the bottle and then for the drops, um, uh -huh. a way I like to do that is with electric fields. So um, I'll be covering when we get to step response. Um, uh, this is two electrodes and right now they're just sensing my hand. Um, yes. but, but they can sense liquids. But what's nice about that is you don't need line of sight optical. It can be completely embedded um, to use electric fields for the sensing. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, what did, yeah. did you, were you able to do the CAD assignment? And yeah, CAD assignment, I only, uh, I have, uh, because I am very new to uh, CAD design, uh, I have okay. uh, designed okay. using the free CAD. Okay. And uh, uh, next week I will upload all these things. Okay. That I will just talk through your experience. Were you, were you able to finish the modeling in FreeCAD? Uh, FreeCAD, I have I basic design of uh, attach and uh, scratch like thing I have designed and over to my paint I use and uh, okay. Did you have any trouble doing that? Yeah, I am facing so many problems because it is new for me. So I I am uh, uh, learning. Uh, I am okay. taking the help of the instructor. Okay. Also, FreeCAD and Fusion and SolidWorks have lots of online tutorials. There, you know, pe yes, people yes. who I'm use them are that. passionate. Yes. So there are many yes. tutorials. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Good. Thank you, Tapas. Thank you. And then the random generator took us right to Sandeep. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Tell also a technical yourself. officer at SDBI. Okay, but say more about yourself, your background, and why you're here. Actually, I'm an engineer, electronics and telecommunication engineer, way back in the year 2008. Since then, I'm working with STBI. Okay. Now, and my organization has provided me this opportunity to uh, go through this Fab Academy training so that we can go for the Fab Labs across the country. Great. And what's your role now at STPI? I'm a technical officer. I look after the networks and uh, uh, other things in the uh, STPI Bhopal Center. STPI okay. Bhopal Center is located in the center of the country. Good. Um, between both of you, one of the projects that's very interesting is um, we had talked before, like I had mentioned the Fab Phi project. Um, uh, this was making citywide data networks from a Fab Lab. So okay. with the Fab Lab, you can make radios and antennas with many kilometer ranges and build mesh networks. And one of the things I've been very interested in is um, like in India, there's a lot of fighting over the different telecom providers um, yes, yes. and the businesses and all of that. But there's an opportunity to, to create community wireless networks on real regional scales. And so, you know, a really interesting yeah. direction would be to, you know, to really build build a user network um, yeah. that the users can I, extend. So we are also pro providing internet services through wireless uh, HTPA, the basic, we are also an ISP, okay. That's we are great. using prevent frequency. Yeah. And again, so so this is really like the last miles that if, if you're building a backbone, you know, mm -hmm. a, a really good fab lab project is to make the last mile connectivity to extend it, you know, down to the end users, where there's just a nice story about the technology is local, the skills are local, the users can extend the network. Good. In the weekly okay. assignments, I have uh, completed the first week assignment. Okay. But on the CAD design, I need to work a bit more. I uh, need to uh, find a way to uh, draw in 2Ds and 3Ds. Okay. Did, did you get started on that or are you, are you behind on yes, that? Yes, I started. I started with the Inkscapes and uh, uh, FreeCAD. Okay. Uh, but, uh, how did that, that go? Uh, Hands-on hands -on has to be done on that. I have uh, designed a few things, but uh, I'm still finding some difficulty in doing that. Okay. Um, Once I go through the tutorials, I think I would be able to do that. Okay. So uh, again, let me encourage you to document as you work. Even if you have troubles, just keep keep tracking pages um, okay. to make the documentation easy. You know, build notes as you're working, and just <clears throat> sort of keep a notebook online um, to follow along. Actually, all of us have just started working on this Fab Academy training from last week only. Okay. So this week we were having two weeks projects. So at least good. one week has been completed. And I think by the next week we would be on track. Okay, good. Okay, good, good, good to meet both of you. Thank you. Um, so now let's go to Spencer in Waltham. Hello, how's it going? Um, tell me about this picture. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, that's uh, the largest pot that we have in our collection of pots. So 
when you say R, who, who is R? I do. Um, I have a catering business. Ah, um, right there. Yep. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Meaning, so it 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 like it where where you pop up to to make ramen? We do. Yes. Yep. Breweries around Massachusetts. Oh, very cool. And then, so what led you to Fab Academy? Um, so I have a carpentry business, um, mostly doing furniture making and cabinetry. Um, and I've sort of slowly been increasing using more visual fabrication tools um, in my work and also in my sort of other jobs doing printmaking and social justice work. Oh, that's great. That's a great mix of backgrounds. Um, there's all kinds of fun um, food connections with Fab Labs. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, these started originally in Japan and have spread all around the world. There are um, fab cafes, which are fab labs with cafes. So you can do rapid prototyping and food at the same time, I mean, merging them. And then um, uh, a, a former student from MIT, now colleague, um, runs um, digital guess, let's see, gastronomy. I think it, it's a dot com. Uh, um, why this is, let me let's see. Oh, actually, I, no, yeah, sorry. I can, I can find this another way. If I go to the schedule and I go to wildcard. And I go to cooking. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, this is a site devoted to digital fabrication. Is research on um, digital fabrication and food, where the goal isn't parlor tricks. It's to be able to make things that you couldn't make without digital fabrication. Um, and of course, there's endless connections to woodworking. Now, since this is the first time we've come to your lab, can you explain your lab? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you can see around super well. The camera's a bit small. Um, uh, so can the camera tilt, tilt down? Can the camera tilt down right. a little bit to see? To, yeah. I'll hold it up too, and point it a bit. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So we're in the SolidWorks um, campus here. Um, in Waltham, Massachusetts. We have a really nice fab lab behind us. Um, and yes, this is where um, SolidWorks get made. So this is sort of a fab lab for the employees and us to come in and get a chance to play around with some of the tools and get a little bit of exposure to the end use of the... I'm a big fan of this lab. This is the home of SolidWorks, and they host a fab academy on their campus. I don't mean, but it helps them. And so, um, any of you are out to feed back into them in the development of the tools. Good. Um, so, had we? Yeah. How did you do? Um, so I started playing around with FreeCAD a little bit, um, and I decided eventually not to go that route. I play about exploring further eventually. Um, so this is actually a sketch model that I drew for. So why don't we jump to the? We'll come back to CAD then. Talk about the final project idea. Yeah. So um, these are references, but um. I'm interested in making a banner printer. So, low resolution, but you can kind of just get words onto the fabric. Uh, long direction. It's just a field. And then why the short direction would be straight. Yeah. Great paint up. Yeah, that's a nice scale. Um, a colleague at MIT years ago did a version of that that was a massive ink that could make um, giant inkjet banners. Um, yeah, registration will be an issue. You, you, you'll either need like um, 
something like a wire or track to align it, or else mm. you'll need to do global positioning uh, for registration. And then, yeah. did you want to spray paint? Is that the idea? Mm. Parts. And so, so now let's go back to Cat Week. Mm -hmm. Finger joints, which is just a very simple yep. um, box show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, um, so these are going through. through um, this is making my first joint. Um, and all the measurements pretty much so I'm going in this is my material, copying it out, the numbers, my first panel. Parts using the extrude function. And then moving further. Yep. So that's my end piece. So I started, I end up with this box and I actually don't want the ends of it. repeating it. So I those joints. And then I'm adding a second. Adding to my existing parameter table um, for the inbox. Okay. Um, so now I'm adding to that. Yep, I'm going to those in. So, okay. Um, yeah, that's that's great prep for the week to come. Uh, that's just right for this week. Um, eventually, for final projects, I like people to do, do better than boxes with finger joints. That there, yeah, there's much more interesting construction you can do, but it's right. a good place to start. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, uh, um, the lab around him is quiet because um, uh, um, right now they're running this event where, I don't know, five, 10,000 people get together um, uh, for uh, the, the larger community around SolidWorks. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, um let's see with spencer yeah okay uh maybe one more random one and then we can just open up to experiments so charlotte sydney um is sydney and charlotte okay Um, okay, hi, tell me about yourself. So, sorry, Sydney. Um, uh, can you do anything uh, for the background noise in your lab? Just we want to hear Sydney. Um, just if they can keep the noise down a little bit. Okay, no, it's, it's not you. I'm just asking them to keep noise down. Okay, go ahead, Sydney. Okay. Oh, okay. But you made a ukulele with um with NeoPixels and Arduinos already. Okay. Um, that's great background for the class. Like you know, the goal of this class is not to use Arduinos, but learn to make Arduinos. So, you know, and not to use mic amps, but learn to make them. And so that's great background for what we'll be doing. Um, what's your final project plan? Uh, uh, meaning, uh, 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 what form is the chart? Is it a picture? Is it, yeah? Okay, 
that's great. Um, uh, I had a student at MIT who for many years has been working on um, things like, uh, uh, she's been working on digital arteries to make, you know, physical models. Um, and she had a project, let's see, I don't know if this is on her site, where she wanted to make a compass that pointed to the center of the universe, wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so those, those are really interesting projects that Amanda's been doing. Um, okay, so now let's look at your CAD week. So talk through your experience. Okay. Okay. And sorry, each each of the circles is a neopixel. Is that the idea? Um, sorry, Salman and Brian. You can hear me. Um, okay, go 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 ahead, Charlotte. Um, one other thing, um, you can use NeoPixels, but one of the interesting things you can do is you can make NeoPixels. And, and the reason to do that is the cost per pixel. So an LED only costs a few cents. A NeoPixel, I forget, but there may be 50 cents or I forget the NeoPixel pricing. Um, uh, so let's see, uh, like you know, here, here's uh, 16 of them for $10, but, but LEDs can cost pennies. And, and so one of the things, and the processors we, we're using can go down to tens of cents and one processor can talk to many LEDs. So one of the things you can do is rather than buying NeoPixels, you can buy LEDs and processors and then and make a network of them and so that that'll bring the cost down quite a bit and it'll also give you some more flex design flexibility because you can uh pick pick the leds um and so that that might let you have um many more leds or pack them more tightly or and make it more cheaply Okay, so it looks like you did fine in Fusion. Uh-huh. Okay, good. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And right, those drawing workbenches are nice for documenting your work. You can make yeah, nice pictures of your work that way. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Sydney. That all looks good. Yeah. Um, so now I want to open up. Um, so um, you can raise your hand or use the chat or unmute. But again, right now, I don't want to just do, I want to prioritize not random questions, but either problems or progress to do with CAD. Um, let's start with who used any other tools? Like, did anybody use X-Design, for example? Um, so if you want to show CAD work, you can unmute, you can post in the chat, you can raise your hand. Um, but let's see who else did other things with CAD. You know, who used Grasshopper, who used X-Design, who used any other CAD tools? Anyone? Um, yeah. Let's see, Crunch Lab. We tried to use, I tried to use Lib5. Yeah, I know it works. Okay, okay, good. So um, whose page it's, should uh, I go to? Sol, big it, S-O-L, uh, yeah, there you are. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, you, um, exactly the second post. And it's the it's the first of the pieces, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I used OpenSCAD before, and I knew about Lib5. I, I think I maybe downloaded it once and uh, saw the example and closed it again. Uh, this this first video is just showing how to get around the bug that I encountered, where it wouldn't wouldn't render anything. Okay. So now um, let me to catch everybody up. Um, Lib5 was developed by a former student, Matt Keeter, who's at Form Labs. And he made a GUI, he made a Python version, a GUI, a C version, has built this lib5 library around it. It's a very powerful geometry engine. Um, he, he's very eager to learn about both uses and problems. And so let's go through, but if you have any issues or progress, um, I, I'll introduce him and involve him. Yeah, the, this particular issue, it was documented on, on GitHub already. So I, I actually found a solution there. So he, he must know about it. Um, yeah, so I, uh, my final project is, is a keyboard. So I modeled the key switches first uh, to have like a reference um, and because they're pretty easy to model. Um, and then I tried to uh, define the, the very complex uh, surface of the keyboard below. So that's, uh, this is the code for the key switches. Okay, um, and just uh, sorry, just to explain to everybody else again, what's interesting about Lib5 is unlike all the other tools, it's using a functional representation that represents geometry as volumes. And so there's all kinds of transformations you can do in this that you can't do with traditional surface representations. Yeah, um, that was, I, I have some experience with that from, from shaders and from doing like uh, visual experiments, ray marching things. So right. I, I knew about that. That's why I wanted to try it out. Um, 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 so let's see. The again, uh, uh, I see in the chat. This is lib five is what we're talking about. Linked on Saul's page. Uh, explain this terrifying looking chunk of sure. code. <laughs> sure. So the the little first block is just some settings for the viewer. That's mandatory. The next block with a defined star is a little helper function to make a box that is centered on the X and Y axis, but not on the Z axis, because I have multiple boxes kind of stacked on top of each other. So that was just a little help for the block below. Then uh, you can see that I'm defining uh, five, five constant numbers, basically four constants, and then I calculate the difference between two of them, and I save those for reference later. So this is basically where the parametric design, I guess, is happening, um, where I put in the numbers from the key switch data sheet. And the next block is a bit, uh, bit hard to read because of the, the page width. But um, basically, I stack up um, two boxes, then I combine two other boxes, and I punch out two more holes from that. And, and the result is the shape in the, in the video above. Yeah. Now, as a CAD beginner, it looks horrible to, to, to work this way. But you'll find the further you get, the more satisfying it is to not just use a mouse, but actually to be able to programmatically describe geometry. 
Yeah, so this is the, the second piece that I tried, which is the, so this is, the idea is to have an ergonomic uh, split keyboard. So this is only for the right hand and you can maybe tell roughly how, how the hand would lie on that. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time getting getting this, um, which is also kind of, a, I don't know, my, my, my decision in the end about Lib5 is that it is very powerful, but it really depends on the use case. So here I was trying to make a very complex shape and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out, but the process was very not straightforward and um, I'm not sure I could fine tune the details the way that I maybe would need to. So this shape basically is composed out of two, two arcs on the, on the X and, and Y axis um, that are, uh, what are those? I don't remember, it's a square, no, it's exponential um, curves basically. Um, and then, and then uh, there's some some push and pull kind of squeezing, uh, like the Blender demo that we saw uh, in the last session, kind of pushes in that little gap for the for the thumb uh, on the side. Okay. Um, something I've discussed with Matt is um, the the one of the first steps in this sequence for him was Anemone, and Anemone has a full GUI for design where you can make the data flow graph. So each of these nodes is a program, but you can make a data flow graph in one window and you can push and pull in the other window. And it's it's much more intuitive, but he's been concentrating on the engine. Um, and the Lib5 engine that's more powerful than Anemone hasn't caught up to the Anemone UI. Um, but I, yeah, if if you're intrigued by Lib5, I would also look at just Anemone for the UI it provides. Yeah, and uh, Antonio, our instructor, also suggested this to me today, and I think I will I will take a brief look um, and kind of see if it uh, if I can handle it better or if I find something interesting there. Uh, and yeah, I also tried FreeCAD. Um, it kind of struggled a lot doing this kind of complex shape there, uh, but I did like it for the kind of uh, plain mechanical tasks. Um, um, yeah, I did some lofting. It was very buggy, it crashed multiple times, and I'm not happy with the tweakability of the result. So I will, I will are, keep are, looking. Sure. Are you using the most recent uh, version? Yeah, I was first. Uh, first, I tried to build it myself, and it came out uh, crashy. And then I, I'm using the app image on Linux. Okay, because the, the see the. The the O nineteen is the um, near release version, um, uh, which is just a, a bit more capable and a bit more stable. Okay, yeah, I will see if I can find a, a build of that. Okay, um, let's quickly see a few other tools. So, like Crunch Lab did Blender. Was that Nicolo? Yes, uh, that's me. Can you hear me? Yeah, levels low. C talk louder or come closer to the microphone. Okay, is it is it better now? It, it's still a little low, but it's good enough. And your camera's not on. Okay, I can turn on my camera too. Okay, but yeah. tell us what you did in Blender. Okay, uh, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. So what is in Blender is basically some renders because uh, uh, since Blender is an animation uh, software. So sorry, that... what did you do the CAD in? Sorry? Uh, before Blender, what did you use for CAD? Uh, FreeCAD, FreeCAD. Okay. So I did basically the modeling uh, with FreeCAD and uh, the render in Blender. So okay, what I good. did is that I, uh, yeah, that's it. Good. Uh, so basically what happens that, uh, what I did is that, can you scroll up a little bit? Yes, 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 cool. Okay, so uh, what I did basically I, Hello? Yeah, you're Hello. good, go. Uh, so what I did is basically I, I modeled the volumes in FreeCAD um, because uh, it's parametric and this allows me to you know, have a model that I can edit when I want. Yeah. And then basically I exported my uh, 3D model from FreeCAD to Blender. Okay. Uh, and then I used Blender to apply materials to each one of the parts I'm designing. Uh, then I added some LEDs and some other components such as buttons and uh, a switch. Yeah. Uh, and then, yes, I used the cycle, uh, it's called cycle, the, the render motor of Blender. 
right. to, to make these uh, these illustrations that right and again in render you can use ev for real time and then cycles for non real time yes yeah well i actually wanted uh, to explore because the story is that uh, i mean my my concept is basically to make a midi controller with a gyroscope in it so that even the orientation of the object uh, is part of the interface and so i wanted to make some animation uh, to to show this thing but uh, well I, I just didn't have time because uh, uh, okay i was working on other stuff okay good um we're uh let's see uh almost out of time let's see other software so uh let's see uh magnus used rhino yeah. hello yeah this is a cubic fab lab yeah we have one of the yeah hi yeah go ahead i use grass and uh, yeah i'd like to share uh, my work with you guys um uh tell cubic. me your name ahmed al mansour from cubic qbic qbic uh no 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 not a qbic and then uh which ahmed yes this one um so if you go to you'll see here yeah uh -huh. I scroll down to the bottom and you'll see I worked on Grasshopper. Yeah, here. Okay. And I try, this has nothing to do with the final project, but I just gave myself a task to generate using um, block programming. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so just to, uh, since it's the first time we're showing it, talk through Rhino plus Grasshopper. So basically uses blocks to create shapes and then instead of commands and then other blocks uh, create dots on these circles. Like for example, in this example, I created a circle and then divided it into dots and then create, chose a block that's called the weave and then it connects the dots between each other and then draws lines between them. Good. Yeah. So that, so but just by changing, yeah. And you yeah, see good. the parameters, just by changing the parameters, you can create different shapes. So yeah, that's a classic use of, um, Grasshopper and Rhino. And again, um, antimony that I mentioned before is similar in having a node editor uh, like that. Um, good. Um, running out of time, um, there's a few questions about motors coming up. Um, you can use whatever motor you want. Um, uh, you can buy servos. Um, Hobby King, uh, for example, brings the cost way down. You don't need to make your own ser servo. Um, I'm not sure I know what dynamixels are, but um, uh, yeah, something like this probably doesn't make sense just for cost um, in that we'll cover a lot on how to make your own controllers. And so um, there isn't a rule on whether or not you buy those, but just you need to be aware of the cost of the motors in that you know, closing the loop and making them smart um, we'll cover how to do that. And so it's really just a question about the, the, the relative uh, cost for that. Um, did anybody use X design? Um, if not, uh, uh, Abhishek sent out, um, a number of licenses for X design and uh, if you have those, I would ex recommend experimenting with it. Um, uh, the, or, and let's see, did anybody use Onshape? Um, if not, I really recommend while you're experimenting, um, look at Onshape and XDesign. Um, those are distinguished in two really important ways. The first one is these have no installation there's no state on your computer. You just use a browser and the state's in the cloud. And they're both designed to have multiple people editing the same file. And so instead of running a client on your computer that you edit, the files in the cloud, you have a browser view to it and you can use it in a collaborative way. And so if you didn't experiment with these, I would recommend going back to try these um, uh, for these uh, cloud design tools. 
Okay. So with that, we're up to 1030 in Boston. I'm going to pause and recording has stopped. Um, yeah, Kaipur is, I see you're saying they're smart servos. Um, again, uh, closing loop with sensing will cover and we'll also cover how to make networks. And so it's really just a question of your time and attention. The, I, I'm not familiar with those. Um, let me go back. Um, uh, it, if you have the budget, it's fine to buy them. It's not forbidden. But on the other hand, um, making networks of smart motors will cover how to do that's both cheaper and you learn more from it and have more control. So it's really just a question of your budget versus time allocation. It's, it's, it's not a central policy. Okay, uh, recording has stopped. We're on bio break. I'm going to mute.
Neil, will you mention much for this week? I have added Silhouette, GCC, and Cricut. I need people to test. Oh, wow. Um, I will mention mods. Uh, where is your work? I should, um, I want to show, where, where should I link to what you're doing? Uh, it's, it's in the Fab Foundation, GitHub dot, sorry, GitHub slash Fab Foundation. And then, and then these mods there. So the, the online version, you. Well, what, what I'll do is um, when I mention mods, um, I'll leave this up. And um, when I get to mods, you can talk about this version. Yeah, and if you see, this is, this is the one I have added for the Camille here. I have modified the, some of the servers that were nice. crashing. OK. Um, that's great. Um, I, I'll, I'll link it to the page after class. Uh, but during class, I'll mention it and have you talk about it. And um, I, I, I see the goal of your project is making me obsolete. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah, meaning, yeah. I'll add new capabilities, but but you know, really building a proper community project. Good.
Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, quarter of, let's rejoin. <clears throat> Recording has started. Welcome back. So finally, we get into the lab and start making. Today is going to be on cutting. And I don't have the link uh, posted yet, but we have a recitation on Monday with uh, May and Norella, who are going to be talking more about um, uh, managing projects. So I've covered project management tools that are going to talk about how to manage your projects. And so cutting. Uh, this week, we're going to cover processes that cut in two dimensions. And if we go back, um, we'll then revisit that in a few weeks, and we'll cover processes that cut in three dimensions. The main tools we're going to cover this week, uh, one is cutting with a knife, a vinyl cutter. Uh, these make signs, but they can make much, much, much more than signs. Uh, I'd say it's the most underappreciated tool in your lab. And then uh, there's a big brother. Uh, um, a lab like mine at MIT is one of these, and you can buy a whole fab lab for one of these machines, but these are the big industrial strength versions. Um, and so uh, cutting with a knife is one crucial thing we'll cover. Then we'll cover cutting with a laser. And uh, there's a number of vendors we work with that make these, uh, including um, Epilogue, Universal, Trotec, GCC, if these are 10 to tens of thousands of dollars. There's emerging uh, DIY lasers that are um, uh, thousands of dollars. Um, less power, uh, and unless you're careful, less um, safety interlocked. And then um, there's higher performance lasers. So former students of mine started this company that makes a 3,000 watt metal cutting laser, for example. And then a lab like mine uses micro machining lasers. So we're going to focus on the, the knife cutter and the laser cutter. Um, a few tools we won't do, but to mention for cutting, uh, plasma cutters um, uh, create a plasma that you can use for metal cutting. It's, um, there's a lot of sparks. You need to do it in a safe environment. There's some cleanup afterwards. Uh, but it's an easy way to cut metal, not with a rotating tool, but with the plasma. Uh, water jet cutters use a supersonic jet of water with a garnet abrasive, and they can do 2D cutting in really any material. Um, High-end ones are, again, as much as a whole fab lab, $100,000. There's lower power, low-end low end ones emerging. Um, they're beloved, although they do need a lot of garnet as an input. That, that does the cutting. Um, hot wire cutters use a heated wire, and the um, main <coughs> excuse me, job for them is cutting foams for things like architectural moldings or arrow forms. And then finally, EDMs cut with a wire that makes a plasma, and these are used to make precision machine components. Again, these machines cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, this is an ongoing project to use an EDM to make an EDM. So those are more, more like super fab lab tools. Uh, within them, this week, we're going to focus on using the knife and the laser. I'd say the laser is the most used tool in a fab lab and maybe overused. The vinyl cutter is the least used tools and the, um, in some ways the most underappreciated. So for this week's assignment, on the vinyl cutter, I just want you to cut anything, um, just to play with it. Uh, the, a killer app for it is to make stickers for your laptop. Um, on the laser cutter, you're going to make a construction kit. Uh, and it has to account, it has to be parametric to account for the curve of the laser cutter that I'll talk about. So you need to pick up from last week and use um, parametric tools. So 
So uh, these are links to what we already covered. In, in Inkscape, you can do very rudimentary parametric cutouts by cloning, but it's not really parametric. Um, this is a link to um, uh, somebody from the class at MIT on using Rhino and Grasshopper um, uh, to do this week's assignment uh, with Grasshopper to make the parametric uh, cutouts. Um, then last week I showed, once again, I'll just skim, uh, FreeCAD has a really nice um, constraint solver. So just to recap, because you're going to need it again for this week, what I'm doing is I'm starting with my design, I'm making cutouts, and then I'm going to uh, link them so they propagate through the design. Um, so that doesn't do anything. And then I'm going to set up a bunch of constraints. So first, those are the same size. Then those are the same size. Um, and uh, those are the same size. And so now I've made a centered cutout that I've replicated. And then I'll give it units and dimension it. And so now I've got that one parameter that propagates through the design. And that's going to be essential for this week because the joint depends on the, your stock. And so you need that as a parametric design. So those are all things we covered last week. Um, then there's a number of tools specifically aimed at cutting. So uh, Onshape has um, Kirimoto. Um, uh, and let's see, the, this next group um, is an evolving set of tools specifically aimed aimed at cutting things out. So exact flat is designed to take a, um, shapes and turn them into things you can cut. Uh, flat fab takes designs and decomposes them into sets of parts you can cut out. Um, Visicut is another tool. Uh, Pepecura is a tool designed for folding. Uh, Cube is a really interesting tool from a colleague in Germany. Um, where if people are interested, um, he can provide access to take 3D shapes and turn them into 2D uh, structures you can cut out and assemble. So these are cutting specific tools. Um, and then uh, mods that we we'll, I'll talk about, we mainly use for CAM, but it also has a geometry engine. And so this is, for example, involute uh, gear design uh, done in mods. Uh, so for this week's assignment, you'll need to pick up from last week with a parametric tool. But then the next step is the cam. And so just this is a trivial image. But uh, once you have a design, this is turning it into a path for the vinyl cutter to make a sticker. This is turning it into a path for the laser to cut it out. So um, a lot of this class will be talking about how your design gets turned into commands for the machine. Uh -huh. Now, for the vinyl cutter and laser cutter, the most common way to use them is print drivers that come from the manufacturer. So um, uh, each of these machines from the manufacturer comes with a print driver um, that look like the like these. And um, that's the most straightforward way to use them. And you should experiment with it. Um, but I've never been a fan of these because there's a lot of state in them. To make a job, you have to click through many menus. And something you need may be hidden a few menus down, and it takes a while to find it. But every machine has a different driver. And so when you take the same design, you have to go through a completely different process on a different driver for each machine. Um, and so over the years, I've written uh, interfaces to the machines that let you use them from a single uh, environment. And the current version of that is called mods. And so in mods, each of these is a module. Each does one thing. Um, 
it, it's a web page containing pages. And then each of these is a, a little program. And you can edit the programs in the programs and the pages in the pages. And what this does is it does what the print driver does, but instead of hiding the internals, it lets you edit them. And so um, uh, let's let's go through. Um, uh, let's first do the vinyl cutter. Um, so if, if we want to cut on a vinyl cutter, and in this case, I'll, I'll take a P and an image as an input. Um, this is where I set the diameter of the tool. And I'll, I'll talk a lot of, well, actually, let's see, why don't I talk about that right now? The um, the laser has a spot size and, and the knife has a thickness. And so if you want to make this shape, but the laser beam goes here, you'll actually make that shape. And so what you need to do is you need to offset. You want the path of the laser or the, the knife to be displaced by the size of the tool. So that's called offsetting. And what's left behind here is the distance from here to here is called the kerf. Kerf. And so kerf is what's removed after the tool goes by. Um, see, somebody needs to mute. And so you need to displace the tool by the kerf. Um, beginner vinyl cutting and laser cutting cuts on the lines, but more advanced is to offset for the tool diameter. And that's what you need when you work with tight tolerances. So um, cur not, not V-E-R-F, K-E-R-F, curf, sorry, K-E-R-F is curf. Okay. So um, this setting is setting the tool diameter then um, if I calculate this, I just made, um, I read in an image, um, if we come over to here, um, this is what I wanted to make. And then it just turned it into the tool path. It turned it into a vector path. And to do that, it's an interesting calculation. This calculates the distance of pixels to the edge um, this offsets for the tool. Um, this finds the edges. Uh, this orients their direction. Um, this then um, vectorizes it. And so this shows you all the steps and lets you interact with them. This then sets the setting for the vinyl cutter. This, this is the force and this is the speed. And then this communicates to the vinyl cutter. So instead of using the print driver, um, if you want to use a different machine, you just change one of these modules for that machine. And this lets you see the whole uh, workflow. Um, so that was from a PNG in. And then we could do the same thing reading an SVG in, which is a, a vector input format. And then um, uh, go, go through the same steps um, and produce the toolpath from the, the vector rather than the, the raster input. Um, so each of the tools we'll, we'll use, um, there'll be an option to use a mods workflow as well as the print driver. And I would experiment with both. I would learn about both. Um, now let me jump to uh, mods is a research project I use in my lab. So I keep adding things and breaking it. Um, it, it's migrating into a community supported version uh, that Fran has been taking the lead on. So Fran, talk about this. Yeah, Neil, uh, actually uh, it's basically the same as your mods. They have some improvements in the UI, deoglifying your <laughs> mods. And uh, I have added a bunch of machines for this week. So I would like, uh, the people to download them and give it a try to check so if it's working. What did you add for this week? I added the GCC vinyl cutter, Cameo vinyl cutter, 
and the cricket vinyl cutter. That's great. Um, and once again, part of what's nice about this is when you, you, you build workflows and then you can save the pages as pages, you can save them as websites. And so you can just open one of these workflows already configured with everything you need end to end to do a job on your machine. So rather than a universal print driver, you can build different workflows for different tasks. Um, and unlike my version of mods, this is now a community project. So I'll keep adding new fundamental features to mods, like the computational geometry and algorithms. Um, but I really encourage this developing as a, people to share these modules. Um, good. Uh, so that's that's cam cam options. So now we come to the vinyl cutter. Uh, here's a great example of a vinyl cutter project. Uh, this is a self flapping crane. So it's a crane that can flap its own wings. And that was done as a, a, a one week assignment in the class. Let's see, Francisco, Dan is asking if there's mod for the silhouette. Yes, there is mod for the silhouette, Camille, and probably this is GPEGL, so maybe it's for other silhouette also. Good. So you could open a mods issue for this week on that. So if we look at this project, um, uh, G did is uh, using the vinyl cutter, she um, cut out, she made the lines to fold the crane, but she also used the vinyl cutter to cut out the circuit and put the circuit on it. So both the folding and the circuit were all done on the vinyl cutter. So again, you can use the vinyl cutter to make a sign, that's straightforward. Um, uh, a killer app for it is uh, thermal transfers. And so if you heat and squish the vinyl, um, you can make things like t-shirts with them. Uh, you can make pop-up greeting cards and pop-up books. You can cut and fold origami and hiragami. You can make masks for screen printing. Um, you can make flexible multi-layer circuit. Um, you can make radio antennas. You could do almost the whole class just using the vinyl cutter. Uh, in the standard inventory is um, a set of materials we use on the vinyl cutter. So um, there's this, this, that, and that. Um, so this um, we, we have this formed into wider roles for it. This is a copper with an electrically conducting glue. It, it's more expensive than the vinyl. A roll is a few hundred dollars. And so the main use of this is to make circuitry. And I'll show you more on that. Um, we have this material um, that is, it looks like vinyl, but it's much heavier duty. It's a cast epoxy film. And again, we have these produced in larger rolls. And so this is much stronger than the ordinary vinyl um, physically and goes to higher temperatures that we use that as, um, as a substrate. Um, there's a masking tape and we use this to lift off the traces. When you cut out, you lift off the traces with that tape. And then this material is um, the least understood uh, and most useful, um, let's see, it's, uh, I'll just show you from here. Um, th this brownish roll of material has a layer of glue that doesn't like to stick to the material. And so it's, it's the word transfer adhesive gets used in two different unrelated ways. One is just tape to lift off the traces. But what you do with this is if you have a material that doesn't have a backing, you, you apply this to it 
And then when you peel it away, you leave the glue behind. And so you can leave something that doesn't have a backing to give it a backing. And so if you want a vinyl cut of material that's like flimsy or you want to make a sticker or adhere, you use that to, as a transfer adhesive. And so each of your labs should have those materials for the vinyl cutter. Um, uh, you'll have knives and they come in different angles. So a, a flatter angle knife is stronger for heavier material. A, a sharper angle um, um, can cut deeper, but bends in a hard material. Uh, we have these materials I mentioned. And one other material you can use in the vinyl cutter is stencils for sandblasting. So this is an elastic material. And when you want to, if you have a sand blaster in your lab and you want to, for example, etch glass, you can cut out a stencil that way. Now, the reason the vinyl cutter is less popular is there's skill in using it and the settings change. So on the laser cutter, the settings are pretty constant. They just depend on the material and the age of your tube. On the vinyl cutter, there's a force. If you don't have enough force, you don't cut through. If you have too much force, you shred the material. There's a speed that you cut. Um, there's a cut depth. And that's a really important one. And this is widely misunderstood. Um, if you take the um, blade in the vinyl cutter, you'll, you'll probably barely see anything. Uh, the blade is barely sticking up here. And that's because you want the blade to just cut through your material, but no more. If it's too shallow, it won't go in. But if it's too deep, you're cutting through the material into the underlay and shredding everything. And so you need to get that setting right. The blade needs to be clean without gunk on it from cutting. And all of those settings depend on the temperature, on the humidity, on the condition of your material. And so it's common to hear a complaint, like I tried the vinyl cutter and it didn't work. And what that really means is you're not in the right range of the settings. Um, it won't work if your material is rough. You should store it so it's smooth. And then you need to do a little test cut to make sure you have the right force, the right speed, the right cut depth, all of that. When you get it right, it works beautifully, but you need to get those settings right. Um, then the other part of using the vinyl cutter is um, you need to weed it. And so uh, this is a student who has a nice uh, just demo videos of the process of um, he's going to make a circuit on the vinyl cutter. And I'll talk more about this in a week when we do electronics. Um, he's doing a trick here, which is he's putting a, an extra sheet underneath the copper to help make it more rigid. Um, he puts, so that was copper, then epoxy, then a flexible sheet to make it even more rigid because he's making a, a circuit structure. Goes into the vinyl cutter. Um, and then when he comes out, what he's doing now is this is the weeding process. Weeding is removing the material you don't want. And um, when everything is cut perfectly, okay, so what just happened there is, um, to go right back to that moment, um, when you've cut perfectly, it's a beautiful process. Um, you just start pulling and the the material that should go comes away and you leave behind everything that's supposed to stay but if you didn't cut it properly it doesn't come up cleanly so weeding should work beautifully and the one other thing that he's doing there is when you weed um rather than lifting up what what you do is you shear so if you pull this way if you pull like this, not like that, the distinction is when you pull up, you're trying to pull everything up. But when you shear, um, it's in plane and you're not trying to lift it out of the plane. And so um, he has all his settings right. And then he shears and he pulls it across and he leaves behind the traces like that. 
And so weeding is a bit of an art. Um, the other note is the material in the vinyl cutter um, does, is designed to come away from the backing. And so you should weed not on the backing of the material. So if, if, if we take, for example, the copper, so you'll, you'll see I stored it with the roll held so it's shiny and smooth. If, if the, it's stored so it's rough, it won't cut. But if you cut out the circuit and try to weed it on its own backing, it'll come right off. Um, these are pressure set adhesives. So what you do is you cut the whole structure, you use the tape to transfer it to whatever substrate it's going to end on, and then you weed it on its final destination uh, because that has better adhesion. And so all of that adds up to there's skill to do it. Um, I'm going to show you in a week, let's see, when we get to electronics production, I'll, I'm going to show you, um, for example, making circuits on the vinyl cutter. And here's a lovely example of a vinyl cut circuit. So just made with a vinyl cutter that you could see through, you can make it on a non-flat surface, you can stick it wherever you want. There are all these great benefits to using the vinyl cutter, but you need to develop skill. You need to learn how to get the settings right, and you need to learn um, the workflow for transferring and weeding. Um, so again, the first assignment is cut something. And the, the straightforward killer app for this week is to make um, laptop stickers. Like, who has a good laptop sticker? Fran, do you? Anybody? Um, yeah, so if you look at uh, Fran, here, Fran, talk so you get focus. This is a five layer vinyl sticker of Kali, Indian goddess. Yeah, here, uh, move it up a little bit. Let us, let us, let us admire Kali. Um, and so all of that is done by cutting and registering on the vinyl cutter. That's a great example for this week. And uh, it, if, you know, signs for your lab, um, uh, is a great um, stickers for your laptop, things like that, or, or you could um, thermally transfer and make a t-shirt, are all things you can do on the vinyl cutter for this week. And I'm going to come back in a week and talk about using it to make circuits. Thanks, Neil. Just uh, a question. Uh, Go ahead. We, we have a cameo. Yep. So we were uh, cutting copper last uh, last year, but yep. the, I don't think that was the correct one because it was not clear the cut. Was not clear? Yeah, it wasn't clear. It was a little bit um, sharpy, you know, but uh, it's, it's not clear. So I'm not sure if I'm using the right, um, the right knife. I'm not sure what you mean by clear, meaning uh, the, 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 the cutting, the edges weren't, weren't sharp. I tell you, what, I, I'm not quite sure what you're describing. Why don't you post an issue on it with, with like, you know, uh, add a, like a picture or whatever you can to describe it and put that in the class issue tracker. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so now we're up to the laser. Um, the laser is probably the busiest tool in the lab. Uh, you can use it to mark, you can use it to engrave. And in doing that, there's a raster mode where it goes back and forth. And you can do that with a vector mode. And in the vector mode, by varying the power, you cut how um, the depth. Um, with a light power, sorry, I closed that too quickly. With a light power, you just draw. And with a heavy power, you cut through. Uh, one of the neat things you can do on the laser cutter is um, uh, by making an image with lots of holes, uh, you half tone. And so um, this is using the laser to cut lots of little holes. And so 
from the distance, it looks like a grayscale image. But what's neat about these is if you backlight it, the light comes through and glows. Um, if you screen print, it lets you screen print not solid shapes, but it lets you screen print with um, grayscale. And so this is how news printing is done. Um, with the laser, you can make uh, halftone masks. And then the main focus today is press fit construction. So um, this is uh, GIC. The history of that is years ago, I was teaching, uh, I was showing my daughter and a friend had a laser cutter and she thought the laser cutter was cool, but I had a dumb box. We were making a box, we were, a dumb project. We were making a box. And so she had the idea of a construction kit. So it became Grace's invention kit that Grace is my daughter. And then my son Eli got involved and he added some parts. So it became the great invention kit. And so this is just an ordinary piece of cardboard um, assembled into a construction kit. So rather than buying Lego with cardboard, you can make as much of this as you want. And this is another great killer app project in the lab because kids can come in and you can make as much of this as you want and they can take it away with them. So to do that, you need to make a joint. So this is a free CAD file. And in this file, I describe a series of types of joints. Um, so this first joint is just a slot. Um, and that one doesn't work very well. Uh, this next joint adds a chamfer, this little facet. Um, and the chamfer is doing two important things. Um, So one of the things it does is if you're slightly misaligned coming in, the chamfer helps align it. And then the second thing is um, cardboard has corrugations. And if the cardboard is slightly larger than the slot, when you push it in, the chamfer slightly compresses it. And so chamfer, so if you make a joint without a chamfer and make it with a chamfer, the chamfer joint is easier to align and holds better. Okay, now the next joint here is, um, if, if you look at um, static and sliding friction, um, the joint holds and at some point it starts sliding. But the holding force of the joint depends on the material, on how it sticks and slips. So this joint adds a little bump. And so um, what that joint does is instead of holding the joint by friction, the little bump as you push it in slides and clicks into place. And so there's a mechanical energy to move that bump that makes a stronger joint. But the problem with that joint is the force to push on the joint depends on the properties of this material. Uh, so this next joint adds a flexure. And so this is like a buckle you might have on a backpack. This has a flexure. And so the, the energy of the joint comes from the bump holding it but the bending energy comes from the size of the flexure that you can decouple from the material. So that's a, uh, a flexural joint. Then this is an even stronger joint. Here, what I'm doing is you slide the materials together. Um, and by sliding it, that controls this direction. And it controls all of the directions except for one, which is tension. And so here, what you do is you put in a pin and you, you have a pinned joint, and so the pin holds it against tension. And so this joint depends less sensitively on the material dimensions, and this has the strongest holding force because you have the separate pin on that. So the, those are all types of sliding joints. Then um, if you want to make a right angle joint, uh, we saw before a finger joint, um, 
just has tabs and fits in a box like that. Um, here, the holding force is just the friction, so it's not great. Um, a, a snap joint has fingers like this that has better holding force. And then the equivalent to the pin joint is a wedge joint where you slide through and then you have a tapered wedge you put in there and the tapered wedge provides the constraint. And again, that, that's the strongest uh, right angle joint. Okay, so those are lots of different types of um, joints. And the important thing to know is to make a good joint like this, you have to be within about five thousandths of an inch. So if you're going to make a um, uh, a slot, and then uh, from this side, here's your stock coming in. Um, this dimension has to be right to within about um, uh, 0.005 uh, inches. If it's smaller than that, the joint won't fit. If it's bigger than that, it doesn't hold together and it's sloppy. But the, the laser beam spot is typically on the order of 10 thousandths of an inch. And so you see the tolerance is smaller e e even than the laser beam. And so what that means is you need to offset. Um, and that parameter is a critical parameter. And so to, to do this design, what I recommend is make a series of cutouts where like, um, each one, if like this is 0 0.004 and this one is 0 0.005 and 0 0.006, um, make a series of slots, each slightly bigger, and vary them to find the right cutout. But Leon, here, Leon, if you talk to get focus. Yeah. Hi, Neil. Good. So uh, Leon is holding up an example of one of these series where you vary the width of the slots um, to characterize your laser. Um, so the first part of the assignment for this week is to characterize for your laser cutter the focal depth. The beam has to be in focus. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about these settings. You have to pick the power, speed, and rate. Um, the curve and then the joint clearance. And I want you to work through those um, uh, to characterize those for your laser. Now for laser cutting, um, the bane of laser cutting is simple finger joint boxes. You can do so much more than that. So um, living hinges is where you make patterns like these that let the structure fold. And then with those, um, this was machining, but it's the same for the laser. Um, you can make flexures, so you can make curving structures, and you can do what's called kerfing, where you don't, don't cut all the way through the stock, so the outside stays continuous, but you have scores on the inside. And with living hinges and flexures and kerfing, your, your 2D laser cutter can make smooth curving 3D shapes. And so one of the things I encourage is for extra credit, don't just make flat things, experiment with things that curve out of the plane. Um, and the most interesting thing you can do on the laser cutter is you can make mechanisms. And so um, this is a thesis from MIT. Um, I'll take a minute to load. Oh, and in fact, actually from the boot camp, let me go to, um, there was a team at the boot camp um, who made a version of one of these. Yeah, so um, th this is the uh, flexure team at the boot camp. Um, and here's a flexure they made. And what the flexure is doing is it's a mechanism solely made on the laser cutter. Let me get, see if I can quickly find the right image. Um, uh, 
Uh, see, I think I've gone too far. Um, I'll take a minute to see if I can find this. Um, so the, um, okay, good, sorry. Yeah, so what you're looking at is one beam bends, two beams does parallel transport, so something stays horizontal, but Z moves. If you have two beams going this way, nested in two beams going that way, when you push on it, you stay in a plane. Uh, uh, mating two of those gives you a horizontal axis. And then mating two of those in another direction gives you a transverse axis. So this is an XY stage without any bearings or moving parts. Now, the issue is the travel you get is maybe a third the size of the structure. So it can't travel the length of the whole structure. It can only travel about a third of it. But by playing with flexures, you can make linear and rotary motion um, just by cutting out shapes. And so that's one of the most interesting things you can laser cut. And uh, this is a thesis from one of my students who recently finished, um, who pushed the limits of laser cutting um, to make microelectromechanical systems. And so he got up to, um, uh, let me find um, here a, a good example image of um, he, he made beautiful micromechanical machines by um, tuning the laser parameters. Yeah, here's a good image to make mechanisms with features down to millionths of a meter. Um, and now that's not an, uh, it's, it's a fancier laser cutter that has the specs to do that, but actually making MEMS uh, with the laser. So what is a laser? Laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. A laser has mirrors and it has a gain medium and light bounces back and forth. And when it goes through the gain medium, it gets amplified. And so the things you need to know about that are um, the gain medium determines the wavelength of the laser. Um, and then the optics of the laser determines the beam profile. And so um, uh, what it looks like is um, in any laser, um, there's a gain medium that has energy coming in. Um, there are the mirrors inside the laser. Um, light is bouncing back and forth. And then there's an output coupler that lets the light come out. Um, the laser beam has a shape. And um, exaggerating, it looks like that. And so this is called the waist of the beam. And um, uh, you have to focus the laser so that the beam waist is where you're cutting. Because if you cut above and below that, um, uh, you're wasting the laser resolution. Occasionally you do that if you want to defocus the laser, if you want to blur it out, but usually you want to cut right where that uh, beam waste is. Um, and uh, so in the types we're going to use, uh, by far the most common laser is a um, CO2 laser. Um, and so this has a discharge and has a CO2 tube. Um, the price of these have come way down. So um, integrated ones like these are thousands of dollars. And then um, uh, nice CO tubes like these are hundreds of dollars. And then um, you can get um, uh, knockoff ones e even less than that. So CO2 is, 10 microns, uh, which is far into the infrared, your eye can't see that. And so um, I'll talk more about safety, but it's very important to be aware that you can't see the laser beam. And so there's risks associated with that. Uh, fiber lasers are a more recent interesting um, type of laser. 
where um, fiber lasers um, the, have an optical fiber that guides light and the fiber itself is doped with a lasing material. And so the fiber itself is the lasing medium. And those you can just keep making more and more of this to get more power. So these have become among the highest power lasers. They're typically one to two microns. That's a good wavelength for cutting metal, um, but not for cutting wood or cardboard. CO2 is great for wood, cardboard, and various plastics. Fiber lasers are good for metal cutting. Um, and then these are various kinds of uh, shorter wavelength lasers. Um, that are typically more specialized, we won't be using. Now, the next thing to know is uh, lasers aren't magic. The material doesn't disappear. It has to go somewhere. And uh, laser cutting isn't a single process. There's many different processes. Um, with the laser, you can burn the material and combust it. Um, you can melt it. Um, you can evaporate it, um, you can ablate it, which is where you blast it out. And typically all of those are happening. So there are multiple processes happening uh, when you laser cut and they depend strongly on the material. Uh, one more implication for that is for a thin, easy to cut material, you can just cut through it in one pass. Um, but for um, thicker materials or harder materials, um, you can't provide enough laser power in one pass to do it. Um, you might need multiple passes of the laser uh, to be able to do it. So then all of this stuff is happening, cutting, burning, melting, ablation. Uh, so an, a very important part of laser cutting is the assist. So you have the laser beam coming in. Um, you have your stock that you're cutting, and in the laser cutter, um, there's a nozzle that has air flowing, and then there's a bed that has an exhaust. And every part of this is important because the laser beam is producing all of these combustion products when it's cutting, and you don't want them to come up you want them to go away. So the air assist is pushing down and then the exhaust is pulling out. <clears throat> and um, that airflow is essential for the laser cutting. Um, it's essential to prevent the material from catching on fire. Um, and it's essential um, uh, to vent um, gases that come out from the laser cutting. Uh, so it, I'll talk more about this when I get to safety, but the airflow is very important for the laser. And then once again, um, uh, the laser has a curve uh, that depends on all of those settings, and you're going to account for that this week. So now we come to safety. Uh, in my lab, there were some students working on a laser cutter. It was a big job. It was going to run for an hour. And so the student was bored and he went off to check his email. And um, he wondered why there was a fire truck outside of the building. A and he didn't realize that uh, his project had caught on fire, the laser had caught on fire, the lab had caught on fire, and he almost burned down the building. Uh, laser cutters want very much to ignite. What they really want to do is catch on fire. And um, if everything is working properly, they don't do that. But uh, the laser cutter used properly is one of the most friendly, useful, um, happy tools in the lab. Um, many fab labs have um, had fires in their labs from abuse of the laser cutter. So there's a number of safety implications for the laser cutter. Um, when you made mistakes with Git, that was okay when you're learning, you don't get to make mistakes with the laser cutter. So the first rule is, if this is your laser cutter in the lab, um, you should have a line drawn on the floor 
and somebody using the laser is forbidden to cross that line. Um, very literally do this if you haven't done it. Um, you always need to be in, have sight lines to the laser to watch what it's doing. And a good way to enforce that is to make a boundary and a laser cutter user has to stay within that boundary. Uh, the laser cutter gets vented. Um, so some of your labs have uh, laser have closed laser cutter filter units, um, uh, units that look like these things. Um, these aren't great. Um, they have a series of filters. The issue with them is they don't remove everything and they have a lifetime. It's much better if you can to vent externally, but you shouldn't vent straight out of your lab into a hallway or a street or a sidewalk because you're just exposing your neighborhood to it. You need to vent away from people like um, on a roof pointing away. So you need to vent. Um, you need to clean optics. So in the laser cutter, um, there's the laser tube um, and then there's an optical path that comes to where the beam comes out. And the um, combustion products from the laser end up on the optics. And eventually, if there's enough of them on the optics, uh, the lens blows up. You destroy the lens. Um, that's not a danger, a physical danger, um, but it's a danger to your lab budget. So it's very important you learn how to clean the optics uh, to keep them happy. Um, and there will be fires. So when you start cutting cardboard, if you use too much power, it'll ignite. Um, the lasers are interlocked. And so if it begins to ignite and you lift the lid of the laser, um, the laser will immediately turn off. And usually that's all you need to do. If it begins to ignite, you open the laser and it's done. Um, but in a bad case, if you really started a fire in the laser, opening the lid feeds it with oxygen. And so you need to put out the fire. And so your lasers should have next to them, the most useful thing is a blanket. So a fire blanket is, which actually something that's a pretty good blanket is just a piece of stock the size of the laser. And if you have a fire in your laser slapping down the stock, um, should put it out. And if it goes beyond the laser, um, you should have a fire extinguisher in the vicinity. So what happened in this picture is the belt broke on the laser. And so the laser stayed in one place and didn't move. And it kept putting all its power into that one place. And that's what caught the fire. If the student had been watching the laser, he would have seen that right away. The problem was he had, had ignored it. So you never turn your back on the laser. You make sure you're set up to put out the fire. You make sure you have good airflow. You make sure the optics are clean. And you make sure you stay with it. You really have to respect the laser. Once again, far too many fab labs have had laser cutter fires. OK, so once you do all of that, then you're ready to use it. Uh, the best material for laser cutting is cardboard. And if you have a piece, so these are cardboard pads we use, um, but you can use um, you know, shipping boxes it, wherever you see cardboard. But the important thing you need to know about, let's see, I don't think I have good cardboard here. Um, no, I, I don't have good cardboard nearby. Um, if you have a piece of cardboard and if you bend it, if it kinks. So um, uh, take a sheet of cardboard. And if you bend it, if you get a sharp kink, um, that's bad. That won't make good uh, laser cutting. Um, if you bend it and it bows like that, it bows continuously, that's good. It means it's springier and it'll make a good joint. So um, what's called the edge crush test is a spec for the strength of the cardboard. And what you want is something like heavy duty cardboard. So every time a box comes to your lab, just take a flap and bend it. If it kinks, that's not good, recycle it. 
Um, but if it bows, that's heavy duty cardboard and you can use that. Um, cardboard is a fabulous material. It's environmentally friendly. Um, it's recyclable, it's cheap, uh, but you can do amazing things with it. So um, uh, just about every famous architect has had a phase where they um, make cardboard furniture. And so you could make all the furniture in your lab out of cardboard. Um, you could do all of the projects in this class in cardboard, even if you move to other materials later, um, I still recommend going back to cardboard to prototype, to do quick design. And so I would encourage you to stick with cardboard as much as possible for this week. Um, you can laser cut wood. Um, uh, there are vendors like these that produce wood uh, designed for laser cutting. Um, you can have it made to your specification. Um, the issue with laser cutting wood is um, you want pretty tight tolerances on the thickness to be able to make good joints from it. Then variously called PMMA or acrylic or plexiglass or perspex or loop site are all the same thing. Um, it's a laser cuttable plastic. Um, so it, it's a popular thing in the laser cutting. Uh, what you need to know about it well, there's two issues. So one is it's a um, it's a petrochemical plastic, so it's much less environmentally friendly. Um, when you laser cut it, um, it outgasses. So uh, if you come into your lab and you smell a bad chemical smell around the laser cutter, uh, find somebody to yell at. Because what happened is when you cut a material like acrylic, um, for a few minutes, it outgasses. Nasty chemicals are coming off, and your exhaust will sweep them away. But if you immediately open the laser cutter um, right after cutting, um, they'll come into your lab, and you don't want to breathe them. So you need to outgas. Uh, what's nice about acrylic is acrylic glues um, are better than they sound. Acrylic glue actually melts the acrylic. And so the joint is, is as strong as the underlying materials. So with acrylic, you don't just have to make a finger joint. You can actually use the acrylic glue to melt the materials into each other. Um, the other neat thing you can do is you can heat acrylic to bend it after you cut it. And this is a project um, from a colleague at MIT, um, Stephanie Mueller, where um, what she would do is um, in the laser cutter, um, she would first cut out a shape and then she would use the laser. So what she's doing right now is, oh, go away. Um, sorry, it's not letting me cut that away. But, but right now what she's doing is she's using the laser to soften a, a, um, a fold and she's bending the material. So as well as cutting, she's bending it in the laser cutter to make a folded structure. Um, and so again, that's an example of making a non-flat structure. So that's acrylic. The other thing is acrylic is somewhat brittle. It um, it'll, uh, likes to crack. Um, if you make, for example, an acrylic flexure that looks like that, this joint will try hard to crack. Um, you want to um, fill it or chamfer the joints uh, for strain relief. Then um, uh, palm or delrin or acetone, um, they're fairly similar to acrylic and cutting properties. Um, they're, um, they're a little bit softer for plastic flow, but what's nice about them is they deform more happily. So rather than cracking, there's more range to be able to bend them. Um, let's see, Vag is asking about MDF. Um, cutting MDF depends on the um, uh, binders. And so I'm going to talk about more about this in the large format cutting week. Um, uh, plywood and MDF have glues, and some of them have really nasty hazardous outgassing properties. Um, and some of them called uh, various green or uh, friendly versions of plywoods or MDF 
have much friendlier blues that are much less hazardous. And so um, typically MDF that we want to use is thicker than the laser cutter can cut. And so we use it in the machining week. Um, you can cut thinner stock, but for um, both plywood and MDF, you want to try to stay with uh, friendly materials that don't release hazardous um, uh, chemicals uh, when you cut them. And I'll talk more about uh, MDF and plywood in the large format machining week. Uh, polycarbonate, you can't cut without a much more powerful laser. It'll just kind of char. Um, you can't cut. Um, so to cut metal, you need a much more powerful laser. Um, some of your labs have fiber lasers. And um, what you can do with that is um, a great application for that is uh, this is using the fiber laser to remove copper to make fine traces and then using the CO2 laser to cut it out. So uh, um, to get a feeling for the range, a small laser cutter is maybe 40 watts and that can cut thin stock. A, a more substantial CO2 laser is a few hundred watts that can cut thicker stock. And then a really high power laser uh, beyond a typical fab lab is, is kilowatts. So metal needs um, a much more powerful fiber laser. A smaller fiber laser can um, ablate it. Uh, PVC is nasty. PVC plastics release chlorine that you don't want to breathe and it etches your laser. Uh, you can't tell what's PVC by looking at it. Um, a clue is a flame test. If you burn the material and you see color, that's a sign that it has halogens that shouldn't go in the laser. Um, but a, a general rule is you shouldn't put unknown materials in the laser. You should only put materials where they know to come from and certainly avoid um, PVC. Uh, so then come the settings. Uh, so you're in your laser. Uh, one setting is the focus. So remember, there's this beam waste. And typically, you want to place that at your stock. Um, uh, the exception to that is, for example, when I showed you uh, the, um, if we go back to this, sorry, that's the wrong class here. And here, the fiber laser is so fine, it's a few thousandths of an inch, that it leaves behind very fine hairs. And one of the ways to deal with them is to intentionally defocus. So if you cut with the focus below your stock, you're intentionally making the laser beam a bit bigger. And sometimes you need to do that just to blur it out if you're limited by the size. Um, um, then there's the power. And so um, if you cut with too little power, you don't go through. Um, but if you cut with too much power, you can burn the material, you can char it, you can melt it. And so there's a happy place in the power that typically isn't all of the power on your laser. There's the speed. And if you go too slow, you're wasting time and dumping too much power in one place. Uh, if you go too fast, you may not be leaving enough power behind. And then a really important setting is the rate. And so most of these lasers are pulsed. And so if you look at the, the, the laser, it's actually firing a series of pulses. And if the rate is high, the pulses overlap. If the rate is slow, the pulses are separated. And which is best depends on the material. So a high rate gives you the smoothest cutting because the pulses overlap, but you keep hitting the same place over and over. For materials that want to melt back or ignite, slowing the rate down spreads out where you're dumping the energy in. Um, and that can help with things like melting back the surface or igniting the surface. Um, and so the pulse rate is a key parameter. Um, 
let's see, Dan, you're, you're Dan, what are you noting about edge guides? Um, we found that you could laser cut jigs and templates. And then if you don't have a shop out, for instance, you can use that with a router to cut out aluminum parts. Oh, you, you, so you're using the laser cutter to make a template to then go on the router? Yeah, to use a hand router then to cut aluminum, which we were shocked when we figured that out one day. Sorry, say it one more time. You cut a template on the laser cutter. Say it again. So you cut a template on the laser cutter um, that's got the offset you're talking about because your bit has a certain diameter, right? And uh -huh. then you could even have drill bushings and things like that uh, to drill the aluminum too. Then you place it on top of the aluminum and then you take a router and use that with a bearing bit guide to route out the aluminum and make oh, really but, heavy duty parts. Oh, but is this a manual router? Yeah, manual router. Oh, oh so th this, is, this is like um, a, a, a sort of a shaper without the shaper. You laser cut a template and then route around it. Yeah, it's a poor guy's shaper. Got it, okay, good, <laughs> got it. Um, Okay, so you need to pick the focus, the power, the speed, and the rate. Um, each laser has a coordinate system and an origin. You need to understand where it places the coordinate system in the origin. And then you also need to pick vector versus raster. So raster is typically images. You go back and forth and you engrave images. Vector is cutting. Um, you can do mixed vector raster jobs. Um, but often you can, what you think you need to do with raster, you can do by vectoring, for example, by half toning. And so you need to pick the mix of vectoring and rastering. So the first thing I want you to do as a group, and um, uh, yeah, Ulu is asking, um, the group assignment, each student doesn't need to document separately. You can have a single page for the group to document the group assignment on your group site. Um, but I do want each student to link to it and note it. I want you to note what you learned from it. So do the group assignment together, document it together, but on your personal pages, link to the group assignment and just explain what you learned from the group assignment individually. Um, uh, and so check the focus. Uh, look what happens when you cut in focus and out of focus um, to both recognize when the focus is wrong um, and uh, to understand when you do want to defocus. Um, for the materials you'll be using and start with cardboard, do a series where you go from too little power to too much power to see on one end, you don't go through. On the other end, you get a charred mess to see the range. Vary the cut speed. And so make a chart that goes from low to fast speed. Um, play with the rate, this, this key setting, to see what it looks like as you slow down the rate and speed up the rate. And so make um, charts in different materials to show what that looked like. Then um, measure the curve. So just make a slot, like cut out a shape, a, a one centimeter or a one inch shape, cut it out and measure the dimensions to see what the actual dimensions are compared to what you gave it to measure the curve. Um, uh, let's see, is, is it possible to cut vinyl with the laser? It, um, the, the vinyl will try very hard to melt. Um, if you tune the parameters, you can do it. But but a trick for things that are um, you can do if if you just put a sheet of vinyl in the laser, it'll try very hard to melt away. What you can do is you can laminate. So if you have um, the vinyl and you put it, for example, between sheets of cardboard and you cut that whole stack, the cardboard helps keep the integrity of the vinyl. Um, uh, so check the curve. By, by checking the curve, if you have the laser follow a pattern, what it's actually doing is making something smaller than the pattern. So measure the dimensions so you know the curve of your laser. And then do a joint clearance test, like Leon held up. Make a series of slots of varying dimensions and uh, measure them to see what the dimensions are to get a good press fit. 
And then now we come to a fun design assignment. Um, I want you, I want you to design it, laser cut it, and document it. Um, a construction kit. And so here's a lovely example of one version assignment for this um, class. Um, this is a marble track kit. And in this case, what, what, uh, he's using it. This is a binary counter. So it counts marbles in binary made out of this construction kit. So he came up with a set of parts you can use to make uh, marble tracks. So the parts of this assignment are, it's parametric. And now you can see why we needed that. A, a key parameter is your stock thickness. Um, too thin and the joint won't fit, too thick and it doesn't hold together. So you need a global parameter that's the stock thickness, um, parametric kit. Um, you need to account for the kerf. One way to account for the kerf, oh, sorry. Um, I forgot to show you something. Um, uh, this is a free CAD file. Sorry, let me, I skipped over this. Um, so this is an example in free CAD of doing everything I'm describing. So um, over here is the spreadsheet. Um, here are the parts in my kit. Um, here's an assembly with them. And so um, here's my um, constraint design that's parametric. And so here's a big complex constraint design. Then I extrude it and I make my kit of parts. So if I change something, the whole design changes. Um, then over here, I've got an assembly uh, made out of the parts to see how they fit together. Um, and then also here, I'm just showing uh, FreeCAD, for example, it can offset. So um, you can offset with a kit. So many print drivers don't know how to offset. You can offset in a more powerful print driver. You can offset in the CAD tool. And so what I did here is I did an offsetting in FreeCAD or in something like mods, um, it, its job in life is to offset. So again, this is an example of a parametric design of a construction kit with an assembly um, uh, uh, all done in FreeCAD. So you need to account for the curve. And as part of this week's design exercise, I want you to make not just like a box that only makes one box. I want you to make a kit of parts that can be assembled in more than one way. You know, it could make plants. It could make marble tracks. It um, come up with parts that are a system, not just a single design as a design exercise. And then um, if you can, don't just make it flat, try to put curves into it. And there's a misconception that you can't do that in cardboard. Um, if you tune the parameters, you can make lovely living hinges in cardboard. Depending on the design, you need to align it either transverse or with the corrugations. You need to be aware of that. Um, uh, but it needs to be parametric. Um, uh, let's see, so what is the question about parametric? Oh, yeah, so I mean, the parametric design is just parametric in the geometry. The key parameter for this week is the most important one is just the stock thickness that you need, and you'll vary that parameter based on both the stock uh, and the material. Okay. So characterize your laser, vinyl cut anything. Um, appreciate the vinyl cutter. It's underused. Um, learn to respect your laser. And making it parametric, accounting for curve, um, and ideally not flat, is uh, more advanced laser cutting. Um, later in the semester, I'll complain if you just make simple laser cut boxes with finger joints. You know, use this week to play with more interesting types of joint systems and more interesting geometries. OK. 12 o'clock in Boston. Any final questions or comments?
If not, we're finally underway in the lab and looking ahead. Yeah, um, I'll be posting the content from May and Norella. Um, Monday, we'll have the recitation on um, uh, managing your projects. Uh, through this week, we'll continue to debug the slow publishing on um, FabCloud and work on speeding it up. Um, Sarah's asking for the, the joints I showed, the files linked on the page. Um, this is a free CAD file for joints. This is a free CAD file for the GIC. Neil? Yep. yep. Can you hear us? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. This is Romain, and Ambroise has a question. Okay, yes, go ahead. Sir. I, I have a small question about curve. Yeah. Is it an yeah. absolute value or is it uh, dependent of the power of the laser? It, it depends on everything. Depends on everything. And so, it, so it's roughly the beam waist diameter, diameter. diameter. Um, but it varies by a few thousandths of an inch depending on the laser power, depending on the material. Um, it also drifts with the lifetime of the laser. Laser tubes have lifetimes typically over a few years. Um, and so it, you know, the, the variation is like tens of percent. Um, it does vary. Um, uh, but, but again, a, it, it, you'll characterize it, a, a ten thousandths of an inch is a typical rule of thumb, and then it will vary by a few thousandths of an inch around that. Okay, and I, I also, uh... Um, when I cut, uh, uh, for example, a uh, material which is uh, thick, mm -hmm. uh, the curve is bigger uh, on the top than at the bottom. So that de that depends on where, where you put where the focus. We yeah. Here. Right. Well, it, it it's up to you. So that depends on where you put the focus in the stock, and uh, it depends on the joint system. So so you you. It's not an kerf isn't an absolute religion. It depends on the type of joint you're making. So, for example, the pinned so the press fit joints are the most sensitive to to kerf. The pin joints are actually very forgiving. They have much more tolerance for it. And so, you know, where where you put the kerf displacement depends on the application. Depends on the type of the joint system you're using. As you go through those joints, I showed bit by bit they're less dependent on the material parameters and they're more dependent on the cad geometry okay thanks okay okay uh let's see do you have to use cardboard um uh you, you um paper um yeah play with paper but uh for this week i do want you to make joints and so um uh, you, you need to have a construction system where you can assemble the parts together. And so that's why you need something with enough thickness that you can make a joint system. I, I do want you to play with, um, if we go back to you know, the range of types of um, uh, these sorts of joints uh, to, to experiment with them. Okay. Up to 12 o'clock, see you Monday for recitation. Happy laser cutting. This is a fun create creative weeks. Some of the early weeks are less creative. This one has lots of room for expression. So I look forward to seeing what you do next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye -bye. Bye. <laughs> so the recording has stopped. Dan, you're asking Bye -bye. about um, Dan, Dan. You don't have to try all the joints. Just experiment with them. Um, yeah, it, it 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 couldn't hurt to try all of them, but just experiment with them and and see which joints you like. Okay, I'm gonna drop off. Thank you.